arguing with soldiers, delegates and committees who had their own strategic ideas. However, Brusilov was optimistic. So was Kerensky, who issued the order of the day. I call on the army, fortified by the strength and spirit of the revolution, to take the offensive. Kerensky's offensive was launched on July the 1st. There were some initial gains. The provisional government issued an intoxicating communique. July 1st has shown to the whole world the might of a revolutionary army, organized on democratic lines and inspired by a firm belief in the ideas of the revolution. It was a pipe dream. After a few days of partial breakthroughs, the Russian offensive petered out. British military attaché reported... They had lost many of their officers and had no incentive to further effort. In fact, they knew they could retire without fear of being punished. As a Russian artillery general expressed it, they felt lonely out in front and went back to their dugouts to sleep. Then the Germans and Austrians counter-attacked. The rout of the Russian army was overwhelming. of the revolution now made itself felt. It had meant a breakdown not just of the Tsarist regime, but of Russia herself. Solitary, helpless and dismayed, the individual Russian was looking for direction. This was a chaos which anyone might exploit, provided he was ruthless and single-minded enough. Lenin was such a man. He attacked the provisional government continually. And when the news of the disasters at the front reached Petrograd, it seemed that his moment had come. Crowds poured into the streets, calling for peace, bread and freedom, and for the overthrow of the provisional government. To ferment an armed uprising, the Bolsheviks called in the sailors from the naval base at Kronstadt. Everything now depended on the loyalty of the army. An observer wrote, Looking onto the square, I saw an endless multitude packing the entire space as far as the eye could reach. A mass of placards and banners with the Bolshevik slogans rose above the crowd. In the left-hand corner of the square, the black, ugly masses of armored cars loomed up. A French correspondent reported, Suddenly, a shot rang out. Whence had it come from? By whom and against whom had it been fired? Nobody seemed to know but it was immediately followed by other shots, which soon increased to a wild fusillade dominated by the sinister rattle of the machine guns. The bullets whizzed through the wildly fleeing crowd. The army stood by the provisional government, and when it was announced that the Bolsheviks had been receiving funds from German sources, Lenin had to flee to Finland on a forged passport. Other Bolsheviks, including Trotsky, were briefly arrested. 
General Kornilov, the commander-in-chief, was not satisfied with the government's efforts to restore order and continue the war. With his troops, he began a march on Petrograd. But Kerensky, afraid of being branded as a counter-revolutionary, refused to accept his support. He even enlisted Bolshevik aid to stop Kornilov, and thus armed his worst enemies. Trotsky set about drilling the workers into a Bolshevik armed force, the Red Guard. They were to act as shock troops when the moment came for the Bolsheviks to strike. And that moment was now not far off. The Germans did their best to hasten it. They launched an offensive in the north towards Petrograd, turning the Russian flank above Riga by an amphibious landing on an island in the Gulf of Finland. Hindenburg described the operation as the one completely successful enterprise on either side in which an army and a fleet cooperated. The execution of our plans was rendered so doubtful by bad weather at the outset that we were already thinking of disembarking the troops on board. The arrival of better weather then enabled us to proceed with the venture. From that point, everything went like clockwork. We succeeded in possessing ourselves of Urzel and the neighboring islands. One more pressure was thus added to the sense of crisis in the capital. In Petrograd and at the front, Bolshevik agitators worked tirelessly. Soldiers, do not trust these wolves in sheep's clothing. They call you to fresh slaughter. Well, follow them if you like. Let them pave the path for the return of the bloody Tsar with your corpses. Let your orphans, your widows and children, deserted by all, pass again into slavery, hunger, beggary and disease. The Bolshevik following multiplied. Lenin himself returned secretly to supervise the insurrection. On November the 7th, in a superb stroke of political bluff, Trotsky simply proclaimed that the provisional government had fallen and that all power belonged to the Soviet. 20,000 Red Guards appeared on the streets. Bolshevik oratory and subversion worked among the troops. During the next few days, Trotsky's statement became an accomplished fact. The Bolsheviks besieged the Winter Palace, where the provisional government was protected only by a handful of officer cadets and the women's battalion. of hours, the Bolsheviks captured the palace and arrested the provisional government. The provisional government, like the Tsar before it, had fallen without a struggle. Now Lenin could honor his promise of peace. An armistice was arranged with the Germans, and Russian emissaries went to meet them at Brest-Litovsk. The two sides made a strange contrast. The Germans, stiff, correct, experienced, apparently with all the cards in their hands. The Russians, nervous, uncertain, but with at least one good card. They could play for time.
To counter the ever-tightening stranglehold of the Allied blockade, the Germans and Austrians desperately needed access to the vast granaries of the Ukraine. They therefore made a separate peace with the independent anti-Bolshevik government of the Ukraine. A peace treaty with Romania, now near the end of her tether, followed. But there was no peace with Russia. The endless Bolshevik delaying tactics enraged the Germans. They resumed their advance into Russia. The Russian army made no attempt to stop them. Instead, it fell back in a rabble. War is dead in the hearts of men, noted an American observer. The Bolsheviks were forced to accept the harshest terms of peace. The Eastern Front was finished. Hindenburg said, in spite of the conclusion of peace with Russia, it was even now impossible for us to transfer all our effective troops from the east. It was absolutely necessary for us to leave behind strong German forces. Our operations in the Ukraine were not yet at an end. We had to penetrate into their country to restore order there. Only when this had been done, had we any prospect of securing food from the Ukraine. Of a very different import was the military assistance which in the spring we sent to Finland in her war of liberation from Russian domination. The Bolshevik government had not fulfilled the promise it had made us to evacuate this country. We hoped by assisting Finland to get her on our side. of our fighting troops, which still remained in the east, formed the source from which our western armies could be reinforced. Now the patient, enduring German army might at last bring off the decisive victory which had escaped its grasp. The troop trains rumbled across Europe bearing division after division from east to west. Every click of their wheels echoed the ticking away of precious time. For Germany, it was now or never. 